Hey guys, welcome to Bar Z. My name's Stan, and today we're going to start a new series, and it's going to be the teardown of the Johnson Model J bandsaw. Um, you know, it's going to be a multi-part series. <clears throat> I don't know how far apart these uh, parts are going to be, because uh, my time is uh, running pretty scarce. My free time. So, and, and Johnson Model J is uh, happy time for me. It's not really work. All right, so let's get into the Johnson Model J and uh, let's start with the teardown. It's just a big, oily, rusty mess. So let's uh, let's break this thing down. Okay, you guys ready? We're gonna fast forward through all of this. This thing should come apart in about two or three minutes. So let's uh, <laughs> let's get busy. Okay, that's lunch. Okay, well gee whiz, that came apart pretty quick. Actually, it took me about three hours to get it all apart in all major subcomponents. And, uh, you know, then, then comes some of the detail stuff. Um, let's go take a look at uh, getting badging off. These are those uh, little rivets that uh, 
kind of screw in and you have to turn them into a flat blade to get them out. Let's go see how we do that with a Dremel. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, well those all came out without incident, you know, and I saved all the badging. It's in pretty good shape. I am going to rebadge it with that WP&M uh, company uh, badge. That, that's a, uh, that's a, not a manufacturer's badge, but that's a property tag. Um, I did a little Google search and it comes out. Uh, it's the Worthington Pump and Machinery Corporation. Uh, here's, a, here's a quick shot of uh, one of their uh, flyers. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know, it's <laughs> uh, it's a little piece of history there and the original owners of it. They're probably the first ones that purchased it from Johnson. So that's going to go back on it, you know, and that tag's in good shape, that equipment number. All right, some other noteworthy things uh, when we took it apart. Um, you know what, the, the the saw wheels on it, the the wheels that actually run the, run the blade on it, uh, they had tapered roller bearings, uh, heavy duty. Quick picture of that. Okay, so this saw is no joke. Uh, that thing's uh, built like a tank, and every I've been really impressed with everything that uh, that went into the saw as I took it apart. I've done a blade straightening adjustment on these saws before. Worked on them a little bit, but I've never taken one completely apart. So uh, I'm pretty impressed with this unit. Uh, let's go take a look at the old motor controls and how they uh, uh, did it into cycle switch. Okay, here's something you might find interesting. This is an old Allen Bradley manual push button starter. Pretty old school. That's an old AB logo back when they used to emboss labels and rivet them on. And they have this mounted on the saw, actually upside down. That's it sitting like this, right there. And what they did was actually pretty clever. They wanted an end of cycle switch. And let me show you how they did it. They went in, they drilled a hole in the back of the enclosure, and they had this rod. And that, uh, what that does, that's when you're in start, that'll drop out the uh, stop button. So. Uh, Pressure cycle start, the saw comes down. Um, in the back side, there was a, this little twist rod in there. I had to cut it to get it apart. Someone welded a hex bar to it. But this, uh, this rotates as the carriage comes down, hits, it rotates it, and uh, that's what drops out, your, drops out your saw at the end of cycle. Uh, now we're gonna update this. We're gonna get a new, uh, a new starter. This thing is pretty darn old. Why don't you look at that little uh, device in there, how they do it. It's actually pretty clever. These days everyone would have a fit because you're breaking the UL listing on the thing, but uh, this is kind of an electromechanical setup. I'll let you look at those contacts. Um, now these days we don't have stuff like this anymore. We don't do an electro electromechanical uh, setup like this. We use something modern and it's called a shunt. And we're going to replace this contactor anyways. So uh, let me show you what a shunt's all about and how we're going to make that work. Instead of having an electromechanical link, we're going to have an all electrical link. And uh, we're still going to use a manual motor starter, uh, but a shunt is a uh, uh, not really mainstream. People don't know that much about them, but we're going to do an end of cycle with it and uh, show you how to make a shunt work and accomplish the same thing. All right, so uh, if anybody needs an antique, man, I got one. All right, so that's interesting and fun. Uh, that was some horrible camera work. I had the camera pointed right at that, uh, right at that door with all that light coming in, so you, I'm, I'm sorry you couldn't see much. But that's an old electromechanical device, and they use a mechanical trip uh, to, to trip the, uh, the motor starter on a manual unit. 
let's go take a look at how we we do it nowadays. Uh, we do it with a shunt. Let's go see what a shunt's all about. Hey guys, welcome to Bar Z. My name's Stan, and uh, I wanted to share with you a, a very underrated device that. Uh, you know, it's it's an electrical device that often gets overlooked, and it's so dead simple. Oh, peanuts, yuck! Um, it's so it's so dead simple that uh, it often gets overlooked, and uh, we're just going with a real cheap um, uh, motor starter here. This is a manual motor starter, so there's no big mystery there. This is just. Uh, Manual push buttons on off. That's it. Um, and th and this is to re this is a waterproof enclosure unit. This is to replace this old dinosaur, which is an old uh, Allen Bradley. Same thing. Manual push button motor starter. So uh, this is the same thing as that. But there's there's a modern control now, and it's called a shunt. And it's a very, it's a dead simple device. When you add this to this, as long as your motor starter is capable of uh, accepting a shunt, I'm going to show you what it does. Uh, you probably never heard of it. Not many people have. But what this does is it enables this switch to be turned off from a remote location. All right, and. Uh, Let's open it up. Maybe we'll uh, wire it real quick and show you how it works. Okay, guys. Uh, sorry I get, got interrupted and I got I had to get back to this here the next day. Um, uh, as a refresh, we've got the old motor starter, manual push button, just kind of a mechanical unit, and here's a here's a little more modern uh, manual motor starter and. We've installed our shunt on the side. It's right here. And the way we've wired it is we put, uh, um, we brought a wire in from the, from the secondary side here, uh, which turns this into a collapsible circuit. It's going to be self-collapsing. And uh, brought it around and powered up the, sh the shunt here only when our button's pressed. So when our button's pressed right here, we've applied 110 volt power to it. And then we run uh, the neutral out. I, uh, you could run the hot wire out if you like. I'm going to run the neutral out and back. That way if it gets wet, uh, there's never any chance of anyone getting shocked. And uh, this is going to be our end of cycle switch. This is the push button setup. And our motor starter works uh, just the same as the other one. Manual on, manual off. But what we have now, we're in the off position. Nothing there. But when we go on and we hit end of cycle, that's going to trip our motor starter. All right, and uh, you basically turn that into a collapsible circuit. The only time that the power is applied to the shunt is when it's in the in the run position, and, and this gets triggered. But as soon as this collapses, we remove the 110 volt from the shunt. So now we don't. We're not sitting. There. If the machine is sitting there idle with the switch down, we're not applying power to the shunt constantly and and burning up the shunt, wasting power, whatever. So it is a collapsible circuit, um, dead simple, you know. The other alternative <clears throat> would be to make or to buy a magnetic motor starter, put in a control circuit, control transformer, control fuses, blah, blah, blah. It gets large, it gets complicated. Uh, like I said, dead simple, cheapest way to do it. A shunt is basically a one trick pony, but sometimes that's all you need. You you only need to do one thing with it. You know, if you did buy a magnetic motor starter and put all this in, uh, that's kind of a waste of money and space. You know, this is a nice compact little unit, and uh, sometimes you only need it to do one thing, and this is what we're doing with it. All right, guys, uh, thanks for watching. Hope you learned something. A shunt is a very underrated device. I rarely see them used. I just thought I'd uh, show you how to actuate a manual motor starter from a uh, remote location. Thanks. Okay, so that's a modern way to uh, trip a manual motor starter. If you didn't know about them, now you do. Uh, now we got it all apart. We, you know, kind of analyzed a couple of things, and I'll do more later too, you know, as we get into some of the separate components. Um, let's, uh, we, we 
put Jasco on it, which is a which is a nasty paint stripper. Glasses, gloves. Don't get it on. Don't even get it on your skin. It burns like crazy. But it had a lot of layers of gray paint, so we we put Jasco all over it, slathered it on with a uh, paintbrush, and then we bagged it and let it sit overnight, and then we pressure washed it, and all the all the multiple layers of gray paint just came flying off of there. It took us down to the original finish. Let's go uh, take a look at some of the castings and stuff after we uh, got all the paint off. Okay, here's a tip for you. If you're going to use the Jasco type stripper, mm, no, that's clean strip. Uh, if you're going to use it, uh, use some shrink wrap. and uh, After you've applied the stripper, bag it. That way it doesn't evaporate and it can sit there and work its magic. So I got the legs, the table, and both of the side covers uh, bagged and stripping right now. Uh, next up is pressure washing, just to blast off the majority of the gunk, and then maybe we'll get into some sanding. <clears throat> but there's, uh, all the major components there. And there's a cart full of fun. Alright. Alright, so we've unbagged them, we pressure washed them, they went from that ugly gray pretty much down to the original green that's the table that's about a hundred pounds right there uh, I got two weldments that sit inside the legs those have been pressure washed and cleaned and then the side cases what's interesting these never got painted on the inside that's raw cast iron that's the way it was from the factory so never saw a drop of paint all these years Probably blowing out the camera. So if I can flip this pig over with one hand. And that's what it looks like outside. So it's got one layer of uh, the original Johnson Green. You can see there it flash rusted. Down to the bare cast iron. Ready for some camera blowout. But, uh, and then this is going to get one uh, a pretty deep sanding probably with a, like some 80 grit on a on a uh, orbital sander uh, respiratory protection required this is probably an old lead based paint and I'm not taking any chances but those are the side covers there let me get you in here in the dark and there's the inside of one of these side covers again not a, hardly any paint in there a little bit of green not much so I didn't even put stripper on this I just pressure washed it that's it and now we're degreasing with some SAX which is an LPS product uh, very similar to purple power so we gotta get this oil and grease off of there and this will get a coat of red oxide a couple of holes that someone had drilled in there for absolutely no reason uh, those have been TIG welded it was preheated the interior of the holes were uh, die, you know, take a die grinder to them, and then uh, burn all the oil out of the cast iron with a torch, and then uh, TIG welded up with some nickel 99. Works pretty good on cast iron as long as it's clean. Anyone that's ever welded cast iron knows uh, trying to fight the porosity. All right, well that's. Uh, that's all the uh, major components on this, and they're going to be ready for red primer real quick. Okay, guys. Well, that's the end of part one. Uh, you know, that's basically just a teardown. I'm starting to collect parts for it. Um, if you didn't know, the Dake Corporation, D-A-K-E, Dake, they're the ones that make those nice arbor presses. They own Johnson. And uh, surprisingly enough, uh, I sent a laundry list off to Dake of parts I needed. They got them. For a 1951, they even dated my saw for me, 1951, based off the serial number. So uh, pretty cool that Dake's still around and still supporting this product. Uh, and thank you to uh, the people over at Dake for, they got me uh, parts breakdowns. They got me, uh, you know, a laundry list of everything I needed. You know, they had a lot of these hard, I call them hard parts. That's something I can't make and I can't just go to a bearing house or whatever and buy it off the shelf. Hard parts. They got them. All right. Um, stay tuned for part two. Don't know when it's going to be, but it's coming. All right. Thanks for watching.